Thank you, John. Uh, now we're going to move into an engineering application. In particular, I talk about the development of site-specific, risk-targeted, maximum considered earthquake response vector that can be used for the design of all types of structures, not just tall buildings, but structures with all natural periods, uh, range from short periods, intermediate periods, to long periods. And this is for the greater Los Angeles region, and we're going to do this development using both the 3D numerical simulations from CyberShape and the NGA West 2 ground motion prediction equations. So first, I'll give a very brief background on the project, the details of both the simulation approach and the ground motion approaches. And for both approaches, we're going to look at these risk targeting response spectra for a number of sites in the Los Angeles region. And then I'll show the procedure that we use to combine the results from both procedures to produce the final recommended response spectra for LA area sites. And I'll also illustrate the use of our SCET UGMS lookup tool so you can get the ground motions for any site in the greater Los Angeles region. So this project to develop these uh, risk targeted response vector was undertaken by the Utilization of Ground Motion Simulations Committee, UGMS for short, of the uh, Southern California Earthquake Center. This committee was formed in the spring of 2013, and it consists of the following 20 members. So these members uh, consist of structural engineers, geotechnical engineers, and engineering seismologists, and this mix uh, was really required in order for this project to be successful. And many of these people on this committee were involved in uh, boat development uh, for seismic provisions that now appear in our ASCD 7 standard. So let's start with the numerical simulation approach. As Tom mentioned, uh, the CyberShape uses the user 2 models of fault recurrence. These are the same models that the USGS used to develop their ground motion maps, which appear in Chapter 22 of the ASCD 710 standard. Now, this standard is currently used and has been adopted in the International Building Code uh, by the state of California and most other states uh, in, in the United States. Uh, the simulations are done, as Tom explained. Uh, many of them were done so that each grid point, uh, the two horizontal components of ground acceleration were computed. From that, the response spectra of these uh, components were computed, and then because of the large ensemble of motions for given magnitude on a given fault, you could generate the median and the standard deviation, and under the assumption that this distribution is log normal, you can then proceed with the probabilistic and deterministic hazard analysis according to the site specific procedures in Chapter 21 of ASCD 716, with the final result being this risk targeted maximum considered earthquake response spectrum. As Tom explained, this is a 3D physics based model, uh, fault rupture and wave propagation. A uh, few statistics here um, 40,000 regional earthquakes were generated by this code, all of magnitude 6 or greater. So for each magnitude on each fault, there are multiple hypocenter and slip distribution models. And just to give you an idea of how many models were used, uh, 140 such models of slip and hypocenter distributions were considered for a magnitude 6.7 earthquake on the Northridge Fault. All told, there are 440,000 simulations for each of 336 sites in the greater Los Angeles region. These sites are shown here, and they cover portions of Ventura County, Los Angeles County, western parts of San Bernardino, and Riverside counties, and most of Orange County. So this area covers most of the population of Southern California. So the advantages of the 3D simulations for the Los Angeles Basin. Uh, originally, we started this as a pilot project, and we picked Los Angeles because the 3D basin structure, that is the D-wave velocity, S-wave velocity, and the attenuation structure, the Q structure, is well known for the modeling of, of these longer period waves, which are of interest. 
Validations has all, all, also been done. As Tom explained, there are a couple of well-known earthquakes in, in the Los Angeles area. These have been validated against these events. And they've also been validated against recordings from the 1994 Northridge earthquake. Although those validations can only be uh, used for natural periods up to four seconds, because all these records were analog, and this, this size earthquake did not generate any really long period motions in the uh, basins. So one simulation of interest is the great earthquake on the southern portion of the San Andreas Fault. And one of these simulations involved a rupture starting in the Salton Sea, propagating up towards San Bernardino, and ending in the Mojave section of the fault. So what I'm going to show are the results of one of those simulations for five sites. One is Table Mountain in the northeast corner of the slide. It's on a rock site right on the San Andreas Fault. Another rock site in Pasadena uh, near the Rose Bowl. And then three sites within the Los Angeles Basin, downtown Los Angeles, Downing, and Long Beach. And the velocity records are shown here. The three columns represent the three components. The uh, 000 is the north-south, 090 is the east-west, and the vertical component, the last column. And you can see uh, the Table Mountain site, the top row, is very impulsive-like. That's exactly what we'd expect to see for a site near the uh, fault rupture of a large earthquake. Pasadena, uh, the motions are fairly small. It's a rock site outside the basin. In the last three, downtown LA, Downey, and Long Beach, you can see the amplification as you go from Pasadena into the LA basin. The amplitudes pick up and the durations increase. And, and that's what we'd expect. And that's what we've observed during past earthquakes. Uh, one thing to note here is the energy content um, in the basins here. Um, if you look at these waveforms closely, you'll see that there's uh, considerable energy at the longer periods from, say, 4 seconds out to 10 seconds. Now for the site-specific approach using the NGUS2 ground motion prediction equations. This is the so-called ergodic approach. It's the one that's most commonly used presently for site-specific seismic hazard analysis. So here we start with the USER 3 models, and these are the models that the USGS has used to produce the ground motion maps that appear in the ASC 716 standard, which just came out, and which will eventually be incorporated by reference in the uh, 2018 edition of the International Building Code, and likely will be adopted by all of these states. So, to use this approach, we have to select the ground motion prediction equation, and we select the four that have basin depth terms and a shear wave velocity parameter to represent the local geology at a particular site. So what we do is substitute the values at each grid point of these basin depth parameters and B sub S30 directly into the equations, and then proceed with the probabilistic and deterministic analysis to get the risk-targeted response vector at each grid point. There are four equations that are listed here. Three of them have a basin depth term called Z1.0. That's the depth to the top of the layer with a shear wave velocity of one kilometer per second. Camel and Morzovia have a depth term Z2.5, which is the depth to the top of the layer with a shear wave velocity of 2.5 kilometers per second. Now, the V sub S30. Uh, at each grid point, we don't know exactly what that uh, velocity is, so what we do is we repeat the calculation using 13 different values of V sub S30, ranging from 150 meters per second, which is a soft soil site, all the way up to 1,000 meters per second, which is a rock site. So this, this was done uh, so that when a user enters the V sub S30, or a site class, then the interpolation between the values shown here will produce uh, a negligible error. The CyberShake results are valid for the natural period band between 2 and 10 seconds, whereas the results from the NGA West 2 ground motion equations are valid over a uh, period range from 0 out to 10 seconds. So the question is, how do we combine the results for the 
period band in common. That is the period band from 2 to 10 seconds. So we computed the risk target response spectra using both approaches at selected sites in the Los Angeles area to get an idea of what the differences were between the two approaches. And then we developed a procedure for combining the two sets of risk targeted response spectra. And then checked the procedure for about 60 other sites spread throughout that entire region to see if the results were reasonable. So on the response spectra comparisons that I'm going to show here in the next few slides, we're not going to look at spectral acceleration versus period plotted on linear scales. Rather, we're going to transform it to log-log scales of pseudo-velocity versus period, log-period. And the reason for doing that is it's much easier to see the differences in the response spectra between the two approaches, particularly at log periods. We started with 14 sites, but I can really illustrate uh, the trends in seven of those sites. Now, the sites are shown here, and over in the lower right-hand panel are the bar charts showing the values of the two base and depth terms. The upper right panel will show the log-log plot of pseudo-velocity versus period. We'll start with a site in Palmdale, right on the San Andreas Fault. And here you see the cyber shake result plotted in red is anywhere from 10 to 30% lower than the result from the MGAS2 equations. Now this is a rock site. We moved to Pasadena, which is another rock site. And here the results are virtually identical. Now let's move you know, over to the San Fernando Valley, the western part of that valley. It's at a basin edge site, P22. And at longer periods beyond three seconds, uh, the results from both approaches are fairly similar. But when we enter to the Los Angeles Basin, we start to see that in downtown LA, that the CyberShake results are now greater than the results from the NGUS2 equations. And that difference is anywhere from 5% up to 25%, depending on the natural period. Moving over to Century City Plaza, Another location where there's high-rise buildings, the differences are a little greater. CyberShake results are now anywhere from 5% uh, up to 30% or more greater. Moving down to Carson, uh, results in very long periods, greater than 5 seconds, are now up to 30 to 40% greater. And now when they move to Compton, which is one of the deeper basin sites, the deepest in this uh, particular example set. We see that at periods greater than five seconds, cyber shake is greater than the NGA2 width spectrum by a factor of two. So I'm going to pick on this uh, Compton site because this is the one that we had to come up with a procedure that would be acceptable to the structural engineers. Certainly they weren't going to accept results that were a factor too greater than what you would get using the traditional approach. And we knew that going in. There were structural engineers on our committee that told us as much. So we looked at two different methods. One was to weight the hazard curves from both approaches. And that result, not surprisingly, biases the spectrum toward the cyber shape result because the cyber shape result is so much greater. The other procedure was to do a weighted geometric mean of the two response spectra with a stipulation that if the NGA West 2 spectrum was greater than the cyber shake spectrum at any period, we would use the NGA West 2 spectrum. So for periods uh, three seconds and less, in this particular example, we use the NGA West 2 spectrum. Now, we decided to pick the weighted average method, even though from an engineering size biology standpoint it might be more proper to use the weighted average spectrum derived from, the, from weighting the hazard curves. However, this is where an engineering consideration came into play. This cyber shake model, as Tom mentioned, does not account for nonlinear response, both in the near surface and the source. And we know from 
from some research, particularly from nonlinear analysis of uh, local soil conditions at the softer sites, that it can actually lower somewhat the spectrum you would get from a purely linear model. There's also some nonlinearities at the source that might contribute that might contribute to lowering the uh, spectrum of a linear model. There was a practical reason, and that was that if, if the results were too much higher than the result you would get using the NGOS2 equations, it ran the risk of not being accepted. So it was a purely engineering decision to go with the uh, weighted average of the two different spectra. So the weighted averaging scheme is shown here. First, for the NGA plus two equations, each of those four equations were given equal weight. And collectively, they're giving weights that depended on the natural period. So for periods less than two seconds, the NGA plus two equations are valid. And so they were given full weight. But as we went to longer periods, the weight decreased because we felt that they were less reliable as we got out to the longer periods. The CyberShake well results uh, then were given an increasing weight as the period increased. So for periods up to five seconds and greater, for periods five seconds and greater, the weights were equal. And going back to the Compton example, that produced the spectrum that's shown here. And then when we use the NGA West 2 equations to get the results for periods less than one second and transform it back to spectral acceleration and period on linear linear scales, this is the spectrum that we get. And it's a nice smooth looking spectrum. It's the kind of spectrum that structural engineers are used to seeing from a site specific approach. And so this is uh, the result that uh, we would be recommending for this particular site. So let's take a look at this, the results of this procedure, this averaging procedure, for a series of eight sites along the line shown here, starting in the southwest in Palo Verdes Peninsula, moving to the deep parts of the Los Angeles Basin, into the Basin Edge sites, and up uh, toward the San Gabriel Mountains near Mount Wilson. Again, in the lower right panel, we see the basin depth terms plotted here. So let's start with um, the site in the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Now what I'm going to do is just rapidly go through these as we go from site to site. The vertical scale will not change. So you get an idea of how much uh, the motions change as we go into the basin edge, into the deep parts of the basin, the basin edge again, and outside the basin. Site in Torrance. Now uh, we get into the deep parts of the Elba Basin, one of the deep, deepest parts, moving further northeast into eastern Los Angeles uh, and uh, eastern Pasadena, Basin Edge site, and then in San Diego Mountains. So, what you saw here was that there certainly is a correlation, strong correlation, between basin depth as measured by Z2.5 and the level of the long period portion of the risk target response spectrum. So the end products of our project were site specific risk target and maximum considered earthquake response spectrum for the Los Angeles area. Right now we're offering this as an alternative to the spectrum that you would get out of the ASC 716 standard by using the USGS maps, which are bedrock maps that are in chapter 22 of that standard, and the site coefficients F sub A and F sub B, which amplify the motions uh, from the maps, and those site coefficients are in chapter 11. This can be a resource to both building officials and also geotechnical and structural engineers. However, if any of this stuff is going to be used, we had to develop a lookup tool similar to the USGS lookup tool. And now I want to illustrate the use of that tool. Uh, it's, it can be found uh, through this link here. Uh, you don't need to use your iPhones to photograph. You can come up and pick up one of these cars and it gives the web address. And if you have an iPhone, you can actually scan this 
R code and get to the site that way. We have a number of these cards up here, so after the presentation, feel free to stop by and pick one up. So when you click on the link, it opens up to a page that looks like this. The red rectangle, anywhere within that rectangle, you can compute uh, these risk-targeted earthquake response spectra. So let's take a look at the result for downtown Los Angeles, where most of the high-rise buildings are in the greater Los Angeles region. I just picked an arbitrary site. The results really won't vary uh, if you're in this downtown corridor. And this is the, on the page, that's the summary page, one page off, but there will be tabular values of this response spectrum. And this is what the response spectrum will look like. Uh, nice and smooth. But of interest is, how did we get there um, from the two sets of results using the NJOS3 equations and the CyberShape uh, simulations? And that result can be obtained by going to the detailed output which also lists the tabular values from both uh, methods and the uh, weighted uh, average. But you really can't see these differences very well. And so let's go back to the log pseudo velocity versus log period plot for this particular location. And these are the differences between the cyber shake results and the NJUS2 equations. And cyber shake is greater than the result from the NJUS2 equations by anywhere from 10% to 25%. But when we do the averaging scheme, uh, the result is shown here by this green line. And now the question is, how much greater is the recommended spectrum versus the spectrum you would get from the traditional approach from the NGAOS2 equations? And this is it. It's not that significantly greater. Uh, anywhere from 2% up to 12% at most. Um, so it's a modest increase. It's an incremental increase that should impact the design of downtown. Um, so, it, but it is an improvement over what we have now. It's also interesting to compare this recommended spectrum with the spectrum that we would get using the general procedure in ASC 716, that is using the USGS map values for, for generic bedrock condition, and then amplifying them by the site coefficients for in this, in this particular location, uh, which really is for most of downtown Los Angeles, site class C, very stiff soil site. And you can see the differences at the shorter periods, but the longer periods of, of interest to tall buildings, we have to go back to the pseudo-velocity plot. And there you see that there are significant differences. And there are significant differences in the spectral shape and in the amplitude. And I should mention that going forward, we're now in a new code cycle, uh, which is uh, going to be producing the ASCE 722 standard in 2022. And we are moving away from this, uh, this uh, blue line spectrum, uh, which has been the standard spectral shape. It's been in our code for, for decades now. And, and in addition to that, that will still be used because 99% of the buildings really don't involve the use of a site-specific procedure. Uh, but we're going to go to a multi-period uh, definition of the spectral shape that will produce something that looks more like the site-specific spectrum given by the green curve. So that's what the future holds, and thank you for your attention.
And when he presented these results, uh, of course, one of the first questions was, well, how does it compare with the recorded data that we have from several earthquakes? Um, and actually, when we looked at the amplification factors due to the basin effects in Seattle, uh, the results were consistent. And the USGS and the city of Seattle uh, organized a workshop back in March. And the objective was to come up with a procedure that geotechnical consultants can use for the high-rise buildings only, making use of these simulations. And they were used, and it turned out that uh, in six months, it's going to be a requirement that's going to be mandated by the city of Seattle to use the recommendation that comes out of that workshop. And that turns out that it's going to result in about a 20 to 25% increase, maybe a little less depending on uh, site conditions uh, for Seattle. So right now we're in a moratorium period where the structural engineers are now informing building owners that this is coming and it will be required for all the 